afternoon, everyone. My name is Colby Dern. I'm a legislative associate with the National Congress of American Indians, and I will be your moderator and uh, webinar administrator today for um, the Tribal Water Code's Regulation of Water Quantity and Quality in Indian Country. On behalf of NCAI and our co-sponsors, the Tribal Water Working Group, the Native American Rights Fund, the Utten Center, the University of New Mexico, and the Sandia National Labs, I'd like to thank you for attending this webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to go over some of our webinar features. First, you should see on your screen the uh, PowerPoint for today's presentation. If during the presentation you experience any lag in the slides transitioning, uh, it may be a result of the internet connection speed, so just give it a few seconds uh, to update on your screen. Um, currently, uh, with the exception of the panelists, all the audience uh, phone lines are muted and are in listen-only mode. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question, you can type it into the question box in your webinar control panel. Um, after the presentation, we will have a question and answers with the panelists. And uh, you, can, um, you can also ask questions um, out loud. You just have to raise your hand. And uh, I'll go through a couple slides to, to show you how to do that. Um, as you see on the right-hand part of your screen, uh, you have an audio mode box. Make sure that you have, um, you can open your control panel. You can view and select to test your audio. You can go through audio setup if you're having issues with that. And uh, make sure to put in your audio pin if you'd like to ask a question out loud. Um, raise your hand, click the circular button with a hand and the green arrow. That'll alert, uh, that'll alert me that you have a question during the question and answer period. Uh, and then you can also type it into the questions box highlighted below. Um, all of our webinar software archives all the questions submitted to the question box. So if we're not able to answer your question during this webinar, which we should be able to, we can follow up with you afterwards. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded so we can share this presentation with you and others who aren't able to join us on the call. And we'll also be able to send out a PDF copy of our webinar, of our webinar slides for your uh, review and use later on. To begin, uh, to begin this webinar, we'd like to sort of set with the context and, and need that the Tribal uh, Water Working Group has sort of established. Um, of the 566 federally recognized tribes, uh, many tribes have not quantified their water rights. In fact, only 40 tribes have treatment as a state, and only 42 have water quality standards approved. Most tribes lack the technical and administrative capacity to manage water on their lands, and there's a federal moratorium on approving new water codes absent a congressionally authorized water rights settlement. Uh, with climate change uh, occurring, the in there's an increased demand for water, and poor water quality um, Poor water quality require increased attention to water planning and water management. And there's an urgent need for tribes to, be, to quantify their rights and manage their resources as conflicts between users and uses uh, increase. To, uh, throughout today's webinar, we'll be uh, giving a brief history of Indian management of water rights and water quality. Uh, and then we'll be going over a uh, scenario depicting a common water quantity and quality conflict in discussion of how tribal water managers would address it using their water codes. And then we'll go through a, uh, a question and answer period uh, by, by you all on the, on the call. Um, to kind of explain a little bit about, about the group, the Tribal Water Working Group um, is a, is, is, this, is, this is the second in a series of webinars that the Tribal Water Working Group has been doing. And uh, it's, a, it's an informal group of water rights professionals, practitioners, and lawyers who are seeking to improve the management of water resources in Indian Country. And we'll have more information on the Tribal Water Working Group at the end and how to get, how to get more information or, or join um, the group. Um, we're joined by a, by a, by a great uh, a great group of panelists and speakers today who I'm just going to briefly introduce and they'll be able to uh, they'll be able they'll be introduce themselves a little bit more on the call. Uh, first we have Professor Robert Anderson from the University of Washington School of Law. Uh, Dwayne Meacham from the Department of Interior Solicitor's Office. Lois Trevino, a water administrator from the Confederated Colville Tribe. Scott, and Scott Bolgren, the water quality manager from the Pueblo of Sandia. 
And with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Professor uh, Bob Anderson to talk about states' water rights. All right. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Bob Anderson at the University of Washington Law School, and uh, I'm a member of the Boys Fort Band of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, and I probably know many of you from my years at NARF or with the Interior Department. Um, but in any event, um, I'm just going to give some background here about uh, uh, state and tribal water rights uh, in a very cursory fashion. I think that uh, many of you are probably familiar with this, but we decided that we should do this in order to uh, give everybody a common baseline. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the state water rights uh, in the western United States are based primarily on, on prior appropriation doctrine. Uh, the, the idea that the first in time is the first in right uh, in terms of uh, access to any water source from a, a river or a lake. Uh, and the water had to be diverted traditionally uh, for a beneficial use uh, as defined by state law. Uh, In-stream flow uses for habitat and fisheries were not regarded as beneficial uses generally until uh, relatively uh, recently. Uh, the, pro the water rights under state law would be tied to the land where it was used uh, and could be moved uh, generally only with the permission of a state permitting authority uh, and the state rights are lost. Uh, if not uh, used uh, either through abandonment or a statutory relinquishment uh, for a period of years, uh, usually five. Uh, in contrast, uh, Indian water rights uh, are based on federal law, uh, and they've got two basic uh, strands. Number one would be the uh, commonly uh, known uh, Winters Doctrine, uh, which is premised on a treaty executive order or a statute establishing an Indian reservation, usually with uh, an agricultural and homeland purpose, uh, and water would be reserved uh, for those purposes as a matter of federal law as of the date of the establishment of the reservation. The second strand uh, would be the aboriginal water claims, uh, usually in the context of in-stream flows for fisheries uh, protection. Uh, there have been a number of uh, federal cases that we'll look at later uh, that uh, recognize these aboriginal uh, water claims for in-stream flows. And, and the big difference between state and uh, uh, federal rights in terms of uh, their, their legal uh, protection is that Indian water rights have very early priority dates, uh, date of the treaty at least for agricultural reservations and time immemorial for water rights for in-stream flows and other pre-treaty uh, uses. The uh, case of uh, United States versus Winans decided in 1905 uh, lays a lot of the groundwork uh, for uh, many aspects of uh, natural resources protection and, and development within Indian country. And, and in Winans, the court recognized uh, rights of the uh, Yakima Nation and its members to cross uh, private land uh, to get to a usual and the custom stations to uh, engage in fishing activities that were reserved in the treaty, those aboriginal rights. Uh, and the court uh, took an approach that recognized that treaties uh, were not grants of rights to Indian tribes, but reservations of those not surrendered, uh, and that uh, treaties should be generously interpreted uh, as the Indians would have understood them at the time of the uh, treaty. The uh, uh, right of access across private lands uh, also uh, serves as, a, as the foundation for uh, the reserved right uh, to water, which was recognized explicitly uh, in Winters versus United States just three years uh, later. Uh, and that uh, uh, litigation involved the, uh, the, the Fort Belknap Reservation uh, and the waters of the Milk River. It was established. Uh, pursuant to an agreement uh, negotiated and ratified uh, by Congress in 1888. Uh, there was a conflict arose between uh, non-Indian appropriators. Uh, the court assumed that even if the non-Indians began their use of water under state law before uh, the, the Indian tribes did, uh, the tribe's uh, water rights dated at least to the date of the reservation, 1888 which was in advance of the uh, state appropriations. And therefore, the Indian rights, even though they hadn't been actually used 
prior to the non-Indian use, uh, the Indian rights had an earlier priority date because they relate back to the date of the reservation and were superior as a matter of federal law uh, to any uh, state water rights that were, were recognized. And so that was in, in 1908. And, and after winters, uh, next slide, uh, we see that there was relatively little activity that took place in terms of litigation. There were a, a few cases in the Ninth Circuit uh, dealing with uh, various controversies, but for the most part, these court cases uh, uh, served to stop non-Indian interference with Indian irrigation, but they didn't fully quantify uh, the Indian uh, reserved water rights. So no one had it, no one knew what the uh, uh, final entitlement of a tribe might be to to provide for agricultural uh, and other homeland purposes on on Western reservations. And so these open-ended court decrees. Uh, resulted in a, a great deal of uncertainty, um, but uh, it really didn't stop the Bureau of Reclamation and other non-Indian water users from uh, plowing ahead and, and, and building up uh, 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 systems to serve non-Indians. And so tribes were, and their members were left uh, sort of standing with no money uh, to build irrigation facilities as the U.S. Uh, encouraged non-Indian non development of what were uh, tribal resources. Uh, allotment water rights were recognized along with their transferability in one case, uh, but the Supreme Court really had nothing to say about reserved water rights uh, again uh, in the Indian context until 1963, as we can see in the next slide, uh, in Arizona versus California. And, and just go to the next slide with the map, too. Uh, and uh, Arizona versus California uh, dealt with these uh, reservations uh, in uh, pink uh, that are Indian reservations along the Colorado River, uh, and also the federal reservations shown in green along the map. Uh, and, and the court uh, was required, uh, because of the nature of the case, to divide up all the waters of the Colorado River uh, to determine what the final entitlement and full entitlement of the tribes were to uh, water to serve those reservations. Uh, and the, the, the special master who heard the case for the Supreme Court uh, decided that, well, uh, enough water to serve the present and future needs for agricultural reservations uh, would uh, and could be measured by uh, what he called the PIA, or Practically Irrigable Acreage uh, Standard. Uh, and essentially, that standard provided that tribes would be entitled to all water that they were currently or historically uh, utilized to uh, irrigate lands on their reservations uh, and also enough water to irrigate any other lands uh, that in the future could be irrigated uh, in a way that was economically feasible to produce uh, crops. Uh, and it resulted in, a, I'd have to say, a fairly generous award of water to uh, the tribes along the, uh, uh, the Colorado River. Uh, at the same time, the court almost in passing recognized uh, federal reserve rights, non-Indian federal reserve rights, uh, to the wildlife refuges and national forests uh, alongside the, uh, the Colorado River. Again, not much happened uh, until the 1970s uh, when the uh, uh, self-determination era began and the uh, federal administration decided to uh, uh, litigate to uh, protect and quantify Indian water rights in a number of uh, uh, western states, including uh, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, uh, and uh, Montana. Uh, the the uh, U.S. brought cases in federal court. Uh, the McCarran Amendment uh, had been passed in the 1950s and authorized state courts to uh, exercise jurisdiction over federal uh, water rights if they had so-called general stream adjudication, which is a case that would uh, include all uh, water users or claimants to water use on a river system. And the Supreme Court uh, interpreted that McCarran Amendment as allowing uh, state courts to also adjudicate uh, Indian reserved uh, water rights. And so federal courts and state courts both had jurisdiction, but the Supreme Court uh, held that the uh, uh, state courts, if they had, uh, if they started first or at about the same time as the federal courts, could assert 
sole jurisdiction over these water right claims. And so we see uh, a number of states commencing these general stream adjudications. Uh, the Wyoming Supreme Court uh, in the 1989 uh, in the Bighorn uh, adjudication involving the tribes of the Wind River Reservation uh, uh, went to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, and it was uh, re they affirmed a large PIA award uh, in a four to four and affirmed that in a four to four decision, but they rejected any in-stream flow water rights. And this was sort of characteristic of state courts uh, generally being uh, hostile uh, to uh, uh, tribal rights. Uh, in the uh, in their own uh, forums, well, the the PIA standard serves as a standard for uh, uh, agricultural reservations. Most tribes have some agricultural purpose for, behind their reservation, but tribes with treaty uh, reservations for fishing uh, or a history of fishing on their reservations are also entitled to uh, in-stream flow protection. Uh, for those fishery resources. And this is the in-stream flow protection slide, uh, Colby, uh, that uh, uh, and we see several cases up here, two from the Ninth Circuit involving the, the Colville Reservation and the Adair case involving the, uh, uh, the Klamath Reservation, uh, both recognizing uh, tribal rights to uh, in-stream flows for fisheries habitat uh, protection. And again, those have a, a time immemorial priority date, so they're ahead of anyone else uh, uh, on the earth. Uh, the uh, Washington Supreme Court uh, has also recognized these on and off reservation claims for in-stream flows in the Yakima adjudication. Uh, U.S. versus Anderson, uh, a district court decision recognizes that uh, uh, habitat protection right uh, in, in sort of in a water quality context, which we're getting to here, uh, which is the right to keep the water at a temperature uh, that is uh, 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 cool enough to support fisheries populations. So the in-stream flows had to be uh, sufficient to make sure that the water stayed cool. And that leads directly to the next part of our, our presentation here, which is the Clean Water Act. Uh, and uh, Congress passed the Clean Water Act uh, in the early 70s to uh, provide uh, protection and uh, to uh, cure the problem of uh, uh, pollution of uh, waters of the United States. Uh, and parts of that statute uh, allow states and Indian tribes to administer water quality standards uh, and to issue permits and carry out other functions under the Clean Water Act. Uh, the uh, uh, tribal provisions uh, as interpreted right now by EPA, uh, require that tribes uh, demonstrate that they have inherent authority over water resources within their reservations, uh, and especially with respect to non-Indian fee lands, if tribes are going to exercise authority uh, over those uh, uh, parcels of land uh, and individuals. Uh, there's been a lot of litigation over this, um, all victorious on the tribal and uh, federal side. Uh, the EPA rule uh, presumes that tribes have uh, inherent jurisdiction over water because it's, it's so important to tribal uh, life and to health and welfare. Now, this, this whole line of litigation uh, runs up against the uh, Supreme Court's you know, recent and very negative treatment of tribal authority over non-Indian fee lands uh, in cases like uh, Strait versus A1 contractors, uh, Atkinson uh, versus Shirley, uh, and uh, uh, other cases where the Supreme Court has refused to recognize tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians under the so-called uh, Montana test. But EPA uh, has recognized, uh, I believe, uh, approximately 41 tribes who have applied uh, as having inherent authority over non-Indian lands within their reservations and uh, has uh, uh, provided treatment at the state to those tribes under the Clean Water Act. So they can regulate uh, by setting minimum water quality standards on reservation waters uh, that are more stringent uh, than minimum federal standards, and they might be more stringent than uh, state standards outside the reservations. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with the, the Albuquerque versus Browner case uh, in which a Pueblo south of uh, Albuquerque set uh, 
uh, water quality discharges or water quality standards that uh, uh, were, were uh, protective of uh, tribal uh, cultural and uh, religious activities uh, such that uh, when the city of Albuquerque upstream sought to uh, get a discharge permit, EPA denied it on the ground that it would uh, result in impairment of the tribe's uh, waters on the reservation. The Tenth uh, 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 Circuit upheld the uh, treatment of a, as a state by the Pueblo. Uh, the Seventh Circuit uh, and the D.C. Circuit have done so as well in, uh, in other cases. The Supreme Court has never uh, dealt with to consider the issue. Uh, tribes can also issue uh, permits, NPDES permits, uh, but have not done so for you know, a variety of uh, uh, reasons. So the, the matter at hand today is uh, tribal uh, authority to, to regulate water. So it's important in the Clean Water Act context, but it's also important just as a matter of inherent tribal uh, jurisdiction aside from the Clean Water Act. Uh, and again, there has been uh, relatively few cases uh, dealing with this. Uh, again, the Colville case, held the tribal uh, government had the authority to regulate non-Indian uh, fee lands and a non-Indian uh, uh, Mr. Walton on the Colville Reservation. Uh, and uh, U.S. versus Anderson, on the other hand, a Ninth Circuit case, held that the uh, state could regulate non-Indian water use uh, when it didn't affect the tribe's water rights and when it was a navigable river that was only partly within uh, the reservation uh, boundaries. Uh, just a, a couple of other cases that, that don't go too far either is the uh, Holly versus Yakima Nation uh, analyzing whether or not state law was preempted uh, and uh, whether tribal jurisdiction was available. Uh, and the court said, well, the tribe here hasn't shown an adverse effect on health or welfare uh, and the, uh, of the tribe. The uh, Ninth Circuit uh, simply affirmed it with uh, out an opinion, so it's got, I'd say, limited precedential value. Uh, and then the uh, Clinch case out of Montana, uh, um, pointing out that the federal preemption analysis governs the inquiry into state regulatory authority, and uh, that that would be the test to be utilized uh, were the tribes uh, exercising jurisdiction over uh, non-Indians. Well. Okay. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Bob. I just wanted to uh, to invite uh, Dwayne Meacham uh, to. If there's anything he'd like to add about okay. uh, the slides that, that 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 Bob went over. Okay. <clears throat> thank you much. And I have. This is Dwayne Meacham. I apologize. I actually had a lake breaking development in a in an in-stream flow case. I had to deal with. I uh, do want to highlight as Bob has walked through uh, this fun foundation of litigation. To, that we have also uh, in a number of uh, uh, water tribal water rights settlements been able to uh, resolve these same issues of in-stream flow protections and uh, tribal uh, and, and clarify and, and confirm tribal authority uh, for water right management in both the, in in the settlement context in addition to the litigation that, that Bob walked through Bob I appreciate your pinch hitting Okay, and I, I kind of rolled through it because I, I forgot to invite people to get in because it surprised me to have to do it all. But uh, so if anybody else has comments on what I've said so far, um, please uh, jump in. Um, but this uh, tribal uh, jurisdiction to regulate all waters within the reservation is you know manifested through tribal water codes, and I know that uh, Lois and Scott are going to talk about their tribal water codes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that tribes definitely have the inherent authority to regulate water within their Indian country. Uh, and, uh, you know, EPA has found that uh, every tribe that it's considered has inherent authority over non-Indians, and that's been upheld by uh, three federal appellate courts. Uh, the uh, uh, Montana line of cases has been dealt with in, in each one of those uh, uh, determinations by EPA in a way that's favorable to the tribes. Um, and maybe Scott can address this later, but, you know, EPA last uh, April sent out an, a notification of consultation on reinterpreting the Clean Water Act uh, to not require 
the tribes show inherent authority, but instead to uh, treat the Clean Water Act, uh, like the Clean Air Act, as a, as a federal delegation of authority. Uh, and I, I, I looked, and I haven't seen a proposed rule yet, although their timeline from last April said they would uh, consider proposing a rule sometime in the fall of 2014, which is, is right now. Um, but one of the hitches uh, in the tribal regulatory process uh, is the secretarial moratorium on uh, tribal codes. Uh, and you know, that moratorium was adopted by Secretary uh, Morton back in 1977, I believe, uh, and, or earlier, 75. And the uh, 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 moratorium was uh, supposed to be temporary, but it's been you know, over 40 years now. Uh, and it really affects only, it only affects tribes that have a tribal uh, constitutional or code provision that requires secretarial approval of water codes. And so that would mostly be tribes under, organized under the IRA or other tribes that have that limitation in their constitution. Uh, and, you know, and for those tribes, uh, the secretary uh, has uh, refused uh, to uh, approve any of those, those codes. Uh, I don't think that means the tribe can't adopt a code on its own. Uh, it's just that it won't be able to get a, to get approved by the secretary, which you know may be important uh, for for some purposes, but maybe not for others. Uh, and you know, I would hope that people would be putting pressure on uh, uh, my good friend uh, Kevin Washburn to lift that moratorium, uh, or to get Secretary Jewell to lift that moratorium. Uh, and the other option would be to remove the approval requirement from the tribal constitution uh, as uh, well. Uh, and Dwayne, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, settlements. And so most all of those Indian waters rights settlements, of which there are about 25 or 26, uh, have provisions for tribal codes. Yeah, that's correct, uh, Bob. We uh, are able through, you know, given that these uh, settlements are approved uh, through con congressional uh, acts, um, the practice has become to uh, ensure that that, uh, that Congress uh, authorizes uh, with the concurrence of the other parties in, the, in a settlement context uh, for the uh, development and approval and implementation of a tribal water code. Um, that is seen as, as, that has been done for tribes both which require secretarial approval of uh, significant ordinances uh, such as a water code and which are covered by that moratorium and for tribes that uh, do not have that requirement and are not covered by that moratorium. The uh, primary driver there for all parties is um, given they are resolving the tribal water resources, um, the, there needs to be clarity going forward on how to uh, administer those resources given there can be a mix of state and tribal uh, water rights in, in, in and near the reservation. All right. Well, I think, you know, we've, we're, Dwayne and I are pretty much wrapped up. Uh, Dwayne, maybe you can tell us about your late breaking news if it's not confidential. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it, it will be non-confidential. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, we'll look, I hope it's good news. Um, so that's, that's it from, uh, from my end of things here. Uh, so I'll turn it back to uh, Colby. Okay, great. Thank you, Bob, Bob and Joanne. I think we just might take a moment here to pause. I know we have a number of audience questions uh, regarding the secretarial moratorium, and so maybe a little bit for the discussion of that. Um, one of the questions that was asked is, uh, under what authority does the federal government approve water codes? And is there a distinction between federally recognized Indian tribes organized under the IRA and those that remain un un uh, organized under their own inherent authority. I know that was discussed a little bit, but I know a lot of our audience members have uh, asked several questions like that so far. So I don't know if there's any more clarification about that. Well, I, I mean, I'd have to look at each constitution, but generally, you know, a lot of those IRA constitutions say that the uh, if, this, if the tribe is going to adopt an ordinance that affects uh, fee property or non-Indians, uh, either in a taxing contest or another context or other regulations, that the secretary has to approve those codes. 
Uh, and so, you know, I know Secretary Babbitt was asked to lift that moratorium, uh, and he didn't for whatever reason. Uh, but what he did say was that, look, we'll, if you have a requirement like that in your constitution, uh, we will uh, expedite uh, the process of lifting that re requirement of secretarial approval so you don't have to come to the secretary at all for approval of any of these sorts of uh, ordinances. So this is that Wayne, to my, best of my knowledge, I think that's still the policy. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, I'm going to move on to the next portion of our uh, webinar, which is the introduction of a scenario um, with some, uh, with uh, you know, looking at all the information that was provided, um, you know, um, on the background of, of, of Indian water law and taking a look at this scenario, which should be familiar to all of you, uh, we'll be taking a look at how two different, uh, how tribes with uh, two different uh, uh, water quality and water quality concern would be able to address this issue. So as you see on the screen, uh, the scenario is a blank tribe is located in uh, the semi-arid region of inland northwest. And in 1855, the tribe entered into a treaty with the United States where, in addition to the creation of the reservation, the tribe reserved the right to hunt, fish, gather, and pasture animals. In 1987, Congress passed the General Allotment Act and Blank's tribe's reservation was allotted to individual Indians in small farm-sized tracts of 80 or 160 acres. Lands not allotted or held in trust for the tribe were deemed surplus and open to homesteading. Additionally, some allotted lands were sold to non-Indian purchasers after the statutory 25-year trust period expired and the demonstration of competency by the Indian allottee to the local BIA agent. As a result, much of the blank reservation is a checkerboard of ownership with lands held in trust by the United States for the tribe and individual Indian allottees and lands held in fee by Indians and non-Indians alike. X Creek begins just outside of the current boundaries of blank reservation on land ceded by the tribe to the United States when the reservation was established by the treaty. There are no diversions upstream of the tribe and the headwaters are located in a federally protected wilderness area. X Creek is considered sacred, and tribal members use the creek for many purposes, including fishing, irrigation, and cultural uses. It also provides habitat for trout and salmon, the latter of which is protected under the Endangered Species Act. Blank, the manager of Blank Tribe's Water, Re water Resources Department, received a complaint about the construction of a water diversion on X Creek by a non-Indian fee owner who intends to irrigate pasture for cows on land located within the exterior boundaries of, uh, boundaries of the reservation. Additionally, the landowner has created a large feedlot for his cows, a concentrated animal feed operation, or CAFO, and waste from the CAFO will flow into the creek. The Water Resources Department is concerned that the diversion will affect the quantity of the water available to Lottie's irrigating lands downstream. He's also concerned that the runoff from the, uh, from the CAFO will impair water quality, harming salmon and preventing cultural uses of the creek. The Water Resources Department manager goes to the tribe's Office of Legal Counsel to discuss the situation and get advice on what authority he has, if any, to stop the diversion and prevent the creek from being contaminated from the feedlot. So, uh, we have two different, uh, two different statuses of tribal water rights in any country which will be examining these. Uh, the first will be a tribe with a congressionally authorized water rights settlement that is developing or implementing a water code. Uh, the second will be a tribe with an EPA approved water quality standard. Uh, for the first bullet point, um, the tribe looking at is the Confederated Tribes of the Colva Reservation and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Lois Trevino who is the water administrator for, for Colville. Uh, uh, here, uh, throwing it over to you, Lois. Hello, my name is Lois Trevino, and I'm the water administrator for the Colville Confederated Tribes. We're located in um, northeast uh, Washington. Uh, we're a real um, humid or dry area, and um, we have adopted a water code in 1975, and uh, we didn't comply with the moratorium 
on um, water, water codes being developed by Indian tribes. And we went ahead and hired a person to be our water administrator and develop a water code. And we've, oper we've operated from that code since 75. And I've updated the code uh, two years ago. And I'm in the process of, I just finished a new update and need to turn it in to the uh, legal office here and get it in front of the council. Um, and all I've done with a, with a proposed code amendment to uh, chapter 4-10 under the tribe's governance is uh, I wanted to, uh, my goals for the proposed amendment were to protect, add protection for cultural values of the tribe, protect the natural environment of the reservation, and protect the historic features existing upon the reservation, and also to encourage economic opportunity for the tribes. And the reason um, mostly I'm focusing on getting um, water for irrigation out of the Columbia River um, because the Bureau of Reclamation um, built Cooley Dam um, and part of it's on the reservation. And there is not one project that comes from Grand Cooley Dam to the Colville Indian Reservation where we, you know, um, our water rights were walked on when the dam was constructed. And we've yet to address that issue with the Bureau. Um, but our current code is the one that I operate from. And um, currently, that code in the very beginning states what the Colville Reservation believes its rights and purposes to be. And as you can see on the slide, um, the, the, the tribe asserts um, pri uh, jurisdiction over the whole reservation. We don't acknowledge any water claims from the Department of Ecology. We don't acknowledge any water rights that the people um, within the bounds of the reservation hold from the Department of Ecology. And um, I require people to get a tribal application um, along with the ecology application. But I really have a concern about um, double dipping with two permits. And what I really need is to get rid of the state applications, not only to sh because we have the uh, we are rightful in our jurisdiction over those waters, but um, I want I want to close that door for people to um, double dip, and so that we actually know exactly how much water an individual is using and under what authority they are using that water. And it makes sense to me that since we're within the bounds of the Indian of an Indian reservation, and we're uh, we have as a tribe described what our water resources are and what our rights are, um, then we go on to the ownership. And we clearly discuss what our ownership is with, within the bounds of the reservation. And you know the reservation boundaries are described as well, um, that we are the only ones that have any authority to administer water rights or water use in, the, in that setting in the reservation setting. And also on lands that are outside the reservation that were once um, a part of the reservation are lands that are held in trust by the reservation. So we go through um, the ownership. We describe, uh, we describe what, we, what we, when I say we, the Colville tribe sees as uh, what we're have you know what we're stating authority over, um, and then we say uh, that the reason that we're doing this is for the members of the Colville tribe in in perpetuity. So I want to move to the water admin okay application. Um, as I said earlier, it's unlawful to divert you know or utilize any waters without contacting the Colville tribe, any waters of the reservation without first contacting the Colville tribe. And if I, um, I do, um, I have a staff of, there's three of us together. I have a, 
uh, hydrogeologist that I've hired to help me with um, GIS and to also um, go out and do site visits to make sure that there's enough flow to support what the applicant is asking for. And I also have areas of the reservation that I have stated there will be no development in. And um, uh, those are just areas that we set aside um, to not have uh, any water use or any type of development in. And um, Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? So we define the, the waters of the reservation. Clearly, all waters flowing within our boundaries, um, above or below ground, hyd hydraulically connected. Um, that's what we state we have authority over. Next slide. Okay, and now we get to the water administrator, which is the position I'm in for my tribe, and I administer our code. And our code um, is uh, under our, uh, the way we've written it up, it's 4-10 under the governance of the tribe. There's all different types of codes, and mine um, is listed as 4-10. And, and in 4-10, it um, lists out who the water, what the water administrator's duties are. And um, so when somebody um, uses water illegally, or I find a conflict or a question about water, um, I, this is, these are the steps I take. I, um, I collect and organize um, information and studies from all sources um, pertaining to the water of the reservation. I uh, develop such data and studies um, to accomplish the objective of this chapter. And the objective early on that we stated we want is authority over the, the waters of the reservation. And why we want that um, authority is because, you know, to, to serve what we believe the purpose of this reservation um, is. And we are in, um, not created by treaty, but we are created by uh, uh, presidential, the word left my mind, um, uh, the signature of a president is what created my reservation. And uh, we also uh, refer to the a case that was mentioned earlier by Bob, the Confederated Tribes of the Re Colville Reservation, V. Walton, Boyd Walton, and that was on a, a a creek that is completely enclosed within the reservation boundaries and it's no name creek and um, we wanted to establish a replacement fisheries in Omac Lake with a species of fish, um, Lahouten trout. So I make, um, when I, my general authority is to um, um, help people when they submit an application to the tribe to utilize water. I, uh, that's a water use permit. Um, I can um, suggest to the, to the Colville Business Council, the decision-making body, whether or not uh, we should um, enter into a lawsuit or how we should handle um, specifics to do with the water code. Um, I determine rights. Uh, I, I um, can um, issue penalties, which I have. Our penalties run from $500 a day and $500 per um, uh, per um, charge when somebody's breaking the the law according to the tribe's water code. So it can add up pretty quickly. And also I work very closely with fish and wildlife in ensuring adequate levels in streams and lakes for wildlife because it's a real high value here. There's a lot of um, hunters that uh, that's all they um, get by with is 
wild game, and fish. Next slide. In my enforcement of the water code, it spelled out step-by-step um, uh, step in the code. And I can um, come in and completely remove uh, the water work. Um, but I, I can only do that after I've notified the person that, that I'm in, enacting an enforcement on that they, what, what, what their um, mistake is and you know, why they need to have a, a water, water use application approved by the tribe prior to any actions they take. And after that, when it uh, decided that if, if um, the person is in the wrong, then I can go in and remove or make inoperative any water works they have. And I've done that where I've gone and told people um, they're taking water from a source that they don't have the right to and they need to stop that use and they most often refuse to and I can go out and um, break the line or uh, make it inoperable to the point where they can't run water through that. And it's like I forced them into a discussion with me or they go get an attorney and somebody, but there is a discussion about what's taking place. And that's usually how things start. I can go on land, you know, within reasonable hours to look at what's taking place. If I if I am told by somebody that um, a person is utilizing water and they don't know if the tribe knows or not, usually a neighbor gets mad at another neighbor and t tells on them, and then I go out and investigate. And sometimes I do find that there's people using diverting water without permission. And um, so when people try to put up no trespassing signs and close me out, I, you know, I just have to go around that because I need to be able to see for myself what's taking place on the water body. And I do that as well. And I don't, I work alone. I don't have a, a, um, a gun or all I have is a cell phone. And um, I'm looking for people that are complying with the code or not complying with the code. Next slide, please. And then um, also what's very important in a water code besides stating what your rights are and how your move, you know, your, what your, consequently what your behavior is as a result of what your understanding is of your rights, um, the tribe found it very important to make a, a list of uses and the, and the way that they are listed is, exact, is exactly what the preference or the value is to each to each use. So with us, um, I put cultural and religious use as the highest use because that's really where tribes hold their identity is in their cultural and religious uses. Without cultural or religious uses, a tribe would not maintain an identity of where they came from, um, who they are, and what their role is. And um, the next one is domestic uses. I felt that it's very important for people, you know, they have homes, they need water, and a healthy source of water. Um, then I listed municipal uses um, because we have a small municipalities. OMAC Washington is a municipality that we work with. They have a couple of wells located on the reservation. And we, uh, we work with them on their water plan so that we know exactly what all their wells are doing and how much water is going out. And the um, tribal members struggle with the municipal use um, because they feel that they're paying to use their own water. And um, so I do a lot of outreach to educate people about, you know, what, what they what they're paying for, what they're not paying for. And um, then the fourth one I list is stock watering. And that, um, you know, there's uh, 
cattlemen here, although not very many, not as many as there was when I first came to the reservation, but um, some people primarily make their living by uh, livestock. And, I, and the new thing that I included was um, stock watering was on stream and off stream. And then fish and wildlife. Um, as I said, that's a very important value here. Um, a lot of people, we have a lot of very active subsistence hunters, and they hunt for elders as well as their own families. And it's a very important um, it's a very important action that people here take in subsistence hunting. And then agriculture, I want you know I want to get water to Indians so that they can irrigate and utilize um, the water to grow crops to sustain themselves so that you know our reservation community grows healthier all the time because we're self-sustainable, uh, self-sufficient. And I think that makes us stronger as a sovereign. Um, and of course, recreation. Um, this is a beautiful area for recreation. We have beautiful um, places available to us within just minutes a drive from Nestelum Agency Campus. We have Lake Roosevelt. Um, and we have several small lakes, um, Omac Lake, where the Lahoutan Trout, where we ended up in a case with um, Boyd Walton. Um, that's a beautiful, beautiful lake. And we just have several areas that are really good for recreation. Um, in industry, we, ha we support ourselves with timber. That's ma the majority of our income comes from timber. And we've, that's how we came into gaming is that we wanted to take the pressure off of timber and um, we thought we could succeed in gaming and take some of the reliance off of timber and let that resource um, rest. And um, so we looked at gaming to, to do that for us. And then power and mining and other uses. Power right now, um, currently, we're looking at getting some power um, on the reservation, we uh, we don't pay really too bad of rates here on the reservation. It, when I first came here, it was quite high for electricity, but um, that that has been become more reasonable. And mining, um, my tribe doesn't like to mine. the The members don't like mining, so they usually vote it down. But we did have a mine here, and we have small mines all over the reservation. And we have a mine that's just off the reservation, just north of us. And I deal with them all the time on their their um, water plans and or where they're going to transfer something. And I, it's just a constant battle um, to keep up with a mine. Buckhorn mine is the one I'm talking about on, and what they're doing with water and what that water could affect. OK, um, next slide. I guess that was it for the Colville Tribes Water Code. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much, Lois. Uh, the next portion of the scenario we'll be looking at uh, will be a tribe with uh, EPA-approved water quality standards. And for that, um, uh, I'd like to have uh, Scott Balgren, who's the water quality manager from the uh, Pueblo of Sandia, join us. Uh, Scott? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Bogren, and I am the Water Quality Manager for the Pueblo of Sandia. I've been in that position for 14 years, and I'm responsible for a wide variety of environmental and natural resource programs on the Pueblo. The Pueblo of Sandia is a tribal nation outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'd like to talk to you about uh, the a little background here. The Pueblo of uh, Sandia has had uh, approved water quality standards. Uh, since 1987, uh, when, or since 1993, actually, when it was approved, amendments to the Clean Water Act were uh, changed in 1987. Tribes were given the ability to develop water quality standards. It took EPA several years to promulgate the rules for tribes, uh, you know, for adopting water quality standards, and they finally got their act together in 1991. 
Uh, the Pueblo was the first, Sandia was the first tribe in the nation to apply for water quality standards with the intent of protecting the environment, health, and cultural uses of tribal waters. We were the second, we applied, we were the second to uh, get our water quality standards due to a paper snafu, the Pueblo of Isleta, which is downstream of the city of Albuquerque. As Robert mentioned, uh, was the first tribe in the nation to get the water quality standards, and they ended up having to go to the Supreme Court to defend their uh, water quality standards in the case of uh, EPA uh, or the city of Albuquerque versus Browner. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is that uh, these water, the water quality standards, they protect uh, all surface waters that are on the Pueblo. The Pueblo also has included a more stringent definition which uh, waters of the Pueblo, which include ditches, which are agricultural, drains, which are groundwater, and arroyos, which are ephemeral waters, uh, on into our water quality standards. Um, in the scenario, if this was the Pueblo of Sandia, uh, when we went to talk to the Water Resources Department manager, we would start looking at our first thing we would probably do is look and review our water quality standards. We look over the water quality standards. And as you can see here on the slide, that all our surface water bodies shall be free of any contaminant in such quantity and duration as may reasonable, probable health, animal plant life, property, unreasonable interfere with the public welfare or use. One of our designated uses on the Pueblo of Sandia is the agricultural water supply use. And agricultural water means that the use of water for irrigation and livestock watering. And in this scenario, you can see that they were going to try to divert water and use it as for irrigation and livestock watering. Next slide. So we have this standard that deals with agricultural water supply. So what we would do is we would look at, <clears throat> one is fecal coliform, and we have standards, we have uh, numeric standards for that, and we also have uh, other criteria. Next slide. And these substances are also in our livestock water quality standards. So what we would end up probably doing is we would review our water quality standards, we would go up and gather much as information as possible on their CAFO permit, because they are a CAFO, they would probably be have to have a permit and be regulated by either the state or the EPA. And then we would go out and probably do some sampling. And the sampling we would do would be upstream and downstream of the, of the area and check to see if uh, they were and you know, what was happening exactly, you know, and look at any type of other permits that they would have uh, going with it. Um, on this uh, diversion that is basically pretty much trying to be occur on an off, off reservation. Um, since we have approved water quality standards, we would make the case that if the monitoring, uh, here's turbidity again, here's turbidity, a couple more standards that occur um, in relation to the uh, livestock and then our general standard, which is section three of our water quality standards, all of those would apply also to this uh, diversion and the waters of the Pueblo. So we would look at that. We would uh, we would see if um, we since we have approved EPA water quality standards, there are other routes that tribes could go for go to you know to get water quality standards. Uh, their route is tribal adoption of a state's water quality standards. Tribes can do that, and also. Codes or resolutions uh, on water quality standards at the tribal level can, level can also be uh, used in uh, water quality protection. Uh, in the details, the EPA approved is the most stringent and, uh, prior and protective, and it gives the tribal sovereignty authority to protect their waters. The adoption of state water qualities would be good and work, but the con is the EPA will not enforce it, and the tribe would have to set up an enforcement and compliance program on their own. Now, the, uh, the third way the tribal water quality code resolutions or law would allow the tribes to be very protective and develop standards that are more stringent than the state, 
but and then, and then basically these standards would also be tri uh, tribally driven. Uh, but it would take a while to establish baseline data and scientific defensibility. Again, EPA will not enforce these standards, tribal standards, and the tribe would have to set up again an enforcement and compliance program to be able to deal with uh, an issue like this scenario uh, illustrates. Next slide. All right, great. Um, Other options, though, for tribes that don't have water quality standards, uh, what they could do is one of the things that we would look at, if we, let's say we didn't have, the Pueblo of Sandia did not have water quality standards. Uh, what we would look at with the construction of the water division on, on X Creek, as is in, in the scenario, would be, we would look at it as, is X Creek a waters of the United States? If so, then a Section 404 permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would need to be uh, permitted for this uh, diversion to occur. And the question we would have would be, had the tribe, had, what did the tribe consult with or with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers? Or does the tribe need to contact the Army Corps of Engineers to advise them of the situation? Um, if the 404 occurs, then under the Clean Water Act, a 401 water quality certification would also have to occur. And whether that would be from the tribe, if they had water quality standards and were uh, had the authority to do that, uh, at the Pueblo of San Diego, we would. We have 401 certification authority, so we would have to go up and meet with the Corps, which we do on a regular basis, and issue a 401 water quality certification before that. If not, and the water, 401 would have to be probably done by the state, and so the tribe would need to talk to the state and uh, get with them to see what, in their 401 certification, to see what they are requiring of this diversion. Another one is, in this scenario, is that it's mentioned that there was a salmon and a trout, and the salmon is protected under the Endangered Species Act. So under that, the tribe should get um, and gather some information about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or if they have already internally an information on the status and recovery plans, critical habitat, biological opinion, etc., on the salmon to strengthen the tribe's case against the diversion. Uh, cooperation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on this project and its impacts would be very beneficial. Um, then, uh, also, this scenario could also be. Um, an environmental justice issue. If it started, that's a kind. So EPA might be involved to gather information to see if this is something that uh, the Office of Environmental Justice and Tribal Affairs and EPA might have to consider. Um, cultural uses in the area and ways to protect them would be paramount. Um, and uh, setting up. Uh, Water quality monitoring sites upstream and downstream of the diversion to gather information on the water quality would also be very beneficial. Uh, the headwaters, and uh, the headwaters also in the scenario are a federally protected wilderness area, and they will probably uh, have specific standards to, for their use. So there are a lot of various options for the tribes to investigate this diversion and stop it. Uh, uh, or at least if, if it has to go, you know, if, if by chance it goes higher up, then in the, the environment department, that there are ways that uh, this diversion would occur um, with the proper regulatory authorities being involved. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. Uh, first, I'd just like to, to ask Lois, um, after going through um, uh, giving us a great amount of detail on, uh, on the Colville um, uh, Water Code. Uh, Lois, how would you uh, go about in your work addressing the scenario that we describe? What would be kind of what you would go through to um, using the code um, to, to stop it? So on the scenario where the creek begins just outside of the current boundaries of the reservation and there are um, there's a large uh, concern about um, Of the fishing and the habitat for trout and salmon, uh, in which the salmon are uh, under the ESA, I would immediately um, contact 
the person who um, is who started initiated the water use and talk to them about what the concerns of the tribe are and I would I would address you know the uh, the issues for fish for um, fish and wildlife but then I would ask if for a meeting um, where I could bring fish and wildlife and the people that uh, would address um, the cultural issues as well, and we would have a meeting to um, work it uh, work it out, and also use it as an education process uh, for the um, proponents um, in this scenario. But then after we got together and worked out a plan, if um, which usually happens, people. When you get with a proponent on a project that they are doing and they don't realize that they've violated your law, um, they're pretty amenable to after they've listened to what everybody says because in the end, at the bottom, at the very end of the day, we, very, we have the same values, whether we're Indian or non-Indian. And, you know, we want clean water for fish. We want clean air. You know, we have the very same values. So, it's because we have these same values that we're able to come together and form a consensus on what the next action steps will will be. But I can use the water code at, um, as information to help people understand who the tribe is and what rights they're asserting and why. And so the code uh, in the very beginning really helps people understand where the tribe Colville tribe is coming from. In the the one about the manager of a tribe resource department and them receiving a complaint about a water diversion that's really straightforward. That's often what I deal with is uh, just people putting in diversions and they don't realize that they have to contact the tribe. They'll contact the counties or um, they get confused because the Department of Ecology has, for domestic uses, um, people don't have to apply uh, for a, a water right. And here on the reservation, every single bit of water you use, you have to talk to the tribe about. And because we don't have, um, we don't allow anybody to divert water without talking to the tribe first. And so, um, I would I would contact again the proponent of um, on the water diversion, and because it's a non-Indian fee owner, I still have authority over them, as stated in Walton, um, where it states that right at the very beginning of the tribe's water code, it states that the tribe confederated tribes of the Colville Reservation v. Walton that the, the state has no authority um, to issue water permits within the bounds of the reservation. And so based on that Walton right, um, that based on that which is stated in the Walton case, um, I, I act as the administrator um, and requesting this person uh, fill out an application for water use and then um, in dealing with the feedlot, I would bring in, we are just now, um, we have just finished up our request for treatment as a state, and um, I would bring in a, a group of people to address the um, animal waste and the feeding and how it's affecting the creek, and we would immediately stop. I would probably issue a stop work order and um, bring in this group of people to deal with all the violations. And we'd work as a group with this person until um, we were able to um, get to the point where the water is the water is protected, the water quality um, has a plan um, to, bring it, to bring it up to a standard that we require for fish. And um, of our cultural department would be brought in and they would deal with uh, the cultural issues in the area, but it would be a group of people and that's how I would handle it. I would initiate that with a proponent. 
And um, then when I talked to my attorney, um, the, the bummer thing here is that so many attorneys um, come and go from our reservation on water rights that we really don't have anyone for a length of time that is very useful. And so if we had an attorney that I could go to, then I would talk to them if they had time and this was an issue that they wanted to look at, I would, I would talk to them. But um, the reality of the situation is, is for me, since I've been an administrator here, I've really had to school myself on the laws. And I, and I have a real interest in that, not that I want to be an attorney and go to court, but I want the understanding that an attorney has of the um, laws that deal with um, Indian water rights, because they're, they're so different and they're very specific. They're not like the states um, very much. And people don't understand that, that there's a whole set of different laws that deal only with Indian tribes and their water rights. They think just like the states, and they think everything is like that. It, it adds, um, the state processes add for, and the state, what the state has done by issuing permits within the bounds of, the, of our reservation has added to a lot of confusion. It's really mixed things up for people, and, it, and it's taken, I've been an administrator here for about 15 years, and um, it's taken, um, the majority of my time is on education and just helping people realize that they're within the bounds of a reservation. Some people don't even know that they're within the bounds of a reservation. And they're very confused about what processes they're supposed to follow. That's, that's what I have to say about the scenarios. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Lois. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to um, open up uh, the floor for questions from the audience. Again, uh, to be able to uh, participate, you can, uh, you can raise your hand um, to ask a question over the phone by clicking on the, uh, the, the yellow hand with the green arrow button. Or you can also uh, type a question into the question box, and I can uh, read that aloud for you to have our, our panelists answer that. So, Give everyone a few moments uh, to raise your hands if you have a question or to type it into the box um, if you'd like it to be asked. And we have a, our first question is from uh, Joseph uh, McGinn. It says, uh, EPA insists that as a condition of water quality standards and treatment of the state approval that the applicant tribe demonstrate that it has inherent authority to regulate within its borders, that the tribe takes steps to adopt enforcement regulations or other, or other elements of a tribal water code. But the Bureau of Reclamation sits back and imposes a moratorium on its approval of what the other federal agencies insist must be done. Just other, is this just another federal catch-22 or a deliberate disregard for tribal sovereignty? Maybe Dwayne should answer that. No, I think, can I speak? Is this coming through, Colby? Yeah, we can hear you. OK. It's, I mean, I think it is, it's a catch-22, and I think it is the government, you know, shirking its responsibility. Uh, you know, they put that moratorium in in 1975 and said it was going to be temporary and that they were going to get regs in place. And they tried twice to put regs in last time in, like, 1981, and have done nothing since. You know, and they, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, it seems to me that the moratorium ought to be lifted uh, in order to, uh, you know, allow the, the policy the government says it follows of self-determination to, uh, you know, be carried out in the water context. Because until they do that, tribes with that code approval requirement are, are in a catch-22. OK, great. Do any of our panelists uh, want to respond to the question? Good afternoon. Well, some of the, this is Scott. Uh, some of the requirements uh, on the water quality standards is uh, that it, they have to show capability to run. One, one of the things is to run the program so that they have to have uh, environmental or water quality program set up. They have to 
you know, have money to start or get funding for like baseline studies and you know things like that. They also have to be a recognized tribe, have uh, be, have the authority to run the program, uh, which would be within a tribal code or authorization. So developing a full blown water code is not necessarily is not really necessary to apply under the treatment of state, you know, with the EPA. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, any anyone else from the panel? This is Dwayne. I would just Lois. clarify. I don't think that the right. uh, EPA has a similar moratorium, right, Bob? No, but I think the, if if the tribe has to have the inherent authority to exercise this, and there's a limit in their constitution on it. I guess what Scott is saying is that while EPA can go ahead and approve it, despite the fact that the tribe's water code hasn't been approved, and you know, and I guess that's true. And I just wonder, maybe if maybe one of you knows whether or not any of the tribes that have been approved have have had a code that uh, was required to be approved but wasn't approved. And I don't I don't know. I don't know either. I just know that when the call bill went against the moratorium, nobody um, lifted finger to stop us, and we just kept going because of that. And uh, we, when we got the code written, um, we immediately started taking the other steps to um, uh, with EPA, getting all all the um, stuff for clean, you know, for the Clean Water Act, and um, and now. We're up to the point where we just submitted our application for treatment as a state. Um, but the other thing is, is that we don't have, um, we're not adjudicated, or we don't have any settlements. And we are, you know, I'm really urging a water plan be worked on, and that's what we are currently working on. And we are looking at adjudication or settlement. Um, and you know, I have my real reservations about either, um, either one. But I know it's a it's something that we have to do. We we have to quantify or um, lay down what actually is our our water because then that opens the door for us to do a lot of things that we can't do right now, and um, we can use our water without asking um, for everyone's permission. And like if we if we, what I mean is like if we had an irrigator um, down by the Yakima area and they wanted to, they couldn't get any water, we could, uh, where they are, they could come to us and ask us to lease them water and such, and we could. But um, I know that here on the reservation, um, currently, because we're not adjudicated or quantified, we, you know, it really um, nar narrows us in what we can actually do with our water. But what I don't, trust and and I'm probably ignorant ignorant in saying this but I just don't trust the United States in that they are really looking to make tribes whole they've never done that and I don't think they ever will and I think that when tribes are um, strong and that they have an educated workforce that really is understands the goals and the creation of the reservation and how to support that 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 workforce are the worker bees in um, initiating, you know, like we did with with our water code without without the permission of um, Morton at the time, and uh, you know we just went ahead and we've been very pragmatic about the steps we've taken in our water use, and um, I think in all Indian tribes have to be you you know you have to have people that really um, support what you're about and the direction you're going in, because otherwise you, you will just be frustrated. And I would like to hear an answer about um, non-federally uh, recognized tribes. What options do they have? That's it. <coughs> Oh, 
Well, this, this is Bob. I mean, under the, the Clean Water Act and, and most of the federal uh, court decisions involving tribal powers is that they don't recognize the, the authorities of non-federally recognized tribes. You know, they just deal with the powers of, of federally recognized tribes. And so, I mean, there's a couple of cases saying that non-federally recognized tribes have sovereign immunity and, and whatnot, but uh, for the most part, they're in a you know, much more difficult position than even tribes are. Federally recognized tribes, that is. Robert, this is Scott. I think that what it comes down to for non-recognized uh, tribes that it comes down to an issue that I brought up, and my point was that uh, an environmental injustice issue that the tribes need to, you know, pursue, would have to pursue it that way, that, you know, that, that the federal agencies have a trust responsibility for all tribal nations, whether they be recognized or not, and that it becomes an environmental issue, and it would go to, you know, I guess, I don't know exactly where it would go from there, but I think it would have to, you know, that's one way to, they would have to, you know, could pursue it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, great. Um, we had a, a couple more questions. Uh, one is an audio question um, uh, from Vivian Olson. I saw that uh, you had your hand up. Uh, Ms. Olson, if you'd like to ask your question, your microphone is live now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question. Um, if, if their state has, or, so the Prairie Band has a checkerboard reservation, and um, so according to Walton, then um, the state's, uh, and I mean this makes complete sense to me, um, but the, the, the a state, or I'll see, a non-Indian may apply to the state for a permit um, on the fee land that he owns within the ba reservation boundaries. Um, the tribe hasn't got its water rights adjudicated yet, yeah. quantified yet, I mean. And so a couple of different things. I mean, we don't have a water code yet. Um, if we did have a water code, then it sounds like we would move forward and basically, um, I guess, well, I guess I better just ask the question. Uh, what, what do you recommend when the tribe doesn't have a water code and the state notices you, but not in a formal consultative fashion? but just notices the tribe as a, an interested landowner, so obviously not in a government-to-government -government relationship, um, but to comment on the application for a water permit. I mean, what are your thoughts on that in moving forward? Um, this is Dwayne Meekham. I could give a start of an answer. Uh, the uh, Bob Anderson mentioned a case that would be a good starting point on the Flathead Reservation in western Montana where those tribes, the Salish and Kootenai tribes, did confirm all the way through the Montana State uh, Supreme Court that the uh, state, even that, that, res that reservation ha has considerable uh, fee land uh, <coughs> that was opened for um, homesteading and it also has state lands interspersed here and there. <clears throat> uh, nonetheless, the Montana Supreme Court confirmed that until the, all of the water rights were adjudicated on that reservation, there would not, the state would have no jurisdiction uh, to issue uh, at least n no new <clears throat> water rights on that reservation. Okay. Okay, um, I appreciate that. And so was was the Flathead in the process of getting their water rights adjudicated? Um, sorry, yes, they they were and they are. Yes, right. And that's a that's kind of an interesting. That's a good case out of Montana that the court said under state law they had to make sure there was water available for the non-Indian to get a permit. And they said, how can you know if there's water available if the tribe's rights haven't been quantified? And so they denied the state the ability to get the permit. But I think for a, you know the, the, the Walton case and, and the Hawley case out of Yakima uh, both talk about a little bit about when state law simply doesn't apply because it would interfere with tribal law, federal law, and policy. 
And that's the kind of argument that can only be made, I think, if the tribe has a water code in place and is regulating. So you say, well, it's kind of if you don't have your own water code, it's kind of hard to go into court and say, well, the state issuing this permit is going to interfere with our exercise of sovereignty if you don't have a code in place. Um, I mean, you can still make that argument, but it's it's just harder for these judges to understand it if you don't have a if you're not regulating it yourself because you want to be able to say, look. This guy can apply to the tribe, and uh, you know, we'll, like Lois was saying, and we'll consider, you know, giving them a permit and work with them to make sure they get water for what they want, consistent with other environmental and you know other values of the of the tribe and the reservation. But that's mm -hmm. why I think people say it's important to 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 enact these codes, um, even if they can't get approved, if you're if it's required to be approved. If not, just do right. it. Can I ask you one other quick question? Um, but I, I mean, I think that's, that, that does make sense, though, in part, because you're saying, OK, well, you, the state may not have jurisdiction over the non-Indian um, beca because or only if the tribe has got a water code in place. But given the fact that the majority of tribes don't, and given the fact they have federally reserved water rights, um, it seems as though um, at least there should be able to be some sort of a, a stay, but I don't even know if if, if that's. My, I guess my, one of my questions was: When does the Army Corps of Engineers? When does the EPA? When will the, would those agencies? When would it make sense for the tribe without a water code to bring in some assistance from those agencies? Or when at least could they be brought in to show that there's some federal oversight, even if the the tribe doesn't have water codes in place? Well, I'd say a couple of things. One, you know, Scott mentioned, you know, using the cores, it's got to issue these 404 permits if it's, you know, if they're uh, un under certain circumstances and these, but uh, an EPA has got jurisdiction over, you know, water quality if you've got a, a code in place. But if you think they're interfering with your water rights, it's really the Secretary of the Interior in the Justice Department that would have, that you would call on to protect them. And I know Dwayne's way overworked, but when I was at Interior, you know, the and I know this goes on, is that, you know, you would, you know, try to get the United States to uh, take notice and uh, assert and to protect your uh, uh, tribal water rights, either through litigation or at least through, you know, appearing and providing assistance to object to a state permit if you think it's going to interfere with, with tribal rights. Dwayne, does that sound about right? It, it does, Bob, and, and tribes do approach uh, the Interior Department. Um, we the uh, in the Northwest at the Puget Sound, uh, <clears throat> several uh, tribes with uh, smaller reservations but significant uh, 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 off-reservation treaty uh, fishing rights have, through their umbrella fishing organization, tried to make a strong point that uh, for their, from their perspective, protecting their water rights in the habitat areas is, is um, tantamount to uh, uh, also protecting their fisheries. So they have approached, some tribes do approach the <clears throat> department uh, for, for uh, water right protections uh, in our region. I'm in the northwest region. Hmm. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, Thank you. All right, great. Thank you very much for that question and to our uh, panelists for the very thorough and detailed answer. Uh, the next um, question we have is a, is a comment uh, talking about a non fairly recognized tribes from Donna Miranda uh, Begay, so I'll share that because it's uh, pertinent right now. She says, in California, non federally recognized tribes get some support by the California state government. But this is via, uh, via agency, or this is agency by agency. The California EPA may be heading towards a California Native American, uh, heading towards California Native American tribes, which should include both federal and non-federally recognized tribes. And that policy is under development and due out early in 2015. However, non-federally recognized uh, tribal people have allotment land, uh, lands held in trust by the United States. However, little support for them. There's those for them obtaining any water rights or input to unwanted diversions. 
And uh, also in California, unfairly recognized tribal people who have lands that are adjacent of a waterway, they can apply for riparian rights uh, in California through the State Water Resources uh, Board. Uh, the next question we have is from Scott Sullivan, who asks, what tribal authority or oversight is there over off-reservation individual Indian allotments? Well, this, this is Bob. I, I mean, I think that, you know, tribes with off-reservation allotments held by members have, you know, jurisdiction over those, a lot, over those allotments because they're Indian country and, you know, owned or occupied by a tribal member at least. Uh, and Dwayne, as I recall, the U.S. takes the position that off-reservation allotments do have reserved water rights, and I think there are public domain allotments that are off-reservation, at least in some here in Washington, but a lot in Montana and North Dakota and uh, uh, some in Idaho. Uh, that's right, Bob, and, and certainly when, when uh, if a state initiates a, an, a, an adjudication of water rights in a particular basin, uh, and does that in a way where the U.S. Uh, can be joined under the McCarran Amendment, then uh, the United States' as trustee for those allottees would be on point to uh, claim and prosecute those claims uh, for off-reservation off allotments. It, that said, it, it, it doesn't come up uh, a whole lot. Um, we, we do have on-reservation allotments in, held in trust where, again, we also, uh, as trustee, assert uh, water right claims on behalf of those allotments in adjudications. Okay, great. Our next uh, question is from uh, Miranda Compton, who asked, uh, has the Winters Doctrine been applied outside of the prior appropriation context, and or has EPA or Interior taken a formal position on the application of Winters to riparian rights? Bob, I'm sure you've written a paper or two on that. <laughs> well, I, well, EPA has recognized, uh, given treatments as a state to the Mole Lake Band of Ojibwe in Wisconsin, in a case that was upheld by the Seventh Circuit, uh, and that's a riparian state, so they've recognized tribal authority um, in that context. But I, you know, but I haven't seen any uh, litigation at all about uh, the Winters Doctrine applying to uh, in in riparian states. But I can tell you that everybody I've talked to who's uh, either a law professor or you know John Leshy, the former solicitor of the Interior Department. Uh, everyone was of the view that yeah, the Winters Doctrine is a federal law that doctrine that says that uh, uh, when a reservation is created, it reserves enough water uh, for to fulfill the purposes of the reservation, and that applies nationwide, not just in the prior appropriation states. I think it's just come up in the prior appropriation states because we have so much litigation out here over over water. Uh, but uh, as the question reveals, that's probably coming in the in the moister states on the uh, eastern part of the U.S. Uh, in the future here. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph uh, McGinn, who asked, please consider the scenario in which a Pueblo or other tribe has adopted water quality standards but finds that an upstream off-reservation pollution source, such as a cattle operation where livestock are allowed to water and river uncontrolled, is impairing a designated use for a specific numerical standard has been, that has been established by the tribe's water quality standard. Does that tribe have to take an action in state or federal court, or can it adjudicate the offense in tribal court? Scott, <laughs> how would you do that? It would, I mean, the, uh, it's, a, it's, a not, it's, it's not considered a point source, right? No, it's not. It's a non-point source. But <clears throat> we, had a prob we had a similar situation with a spill. Well, we didn't, but the Taos Pueblo did, which is in northern New Mexico, um, about almost two years ago now. And the problem was, that 
one of the problems was that EPA, after they developed or uh, had all these tribes adopt water quality standards, had no procedures for or or SOPs for how to deal with a non-offsite violation, which was surprising since you know basically they adopted these procedures in 1993. They never thought about what happens if somebody discharges or has a, something upstream off reservation. Uh, a tribe could, I think, if they developed an enforcement and compliance program, then they could theoretically take it through tribal courts. But they would have to have a program, and that would have to be approved by EPA. Currently, most of the tribes do have the enforcement and compliance program, you know, done through the EPA. But if they have, you know, but there are ways you could develop a program um, and, you know, develop it to, to be able to do the, to, do, to go through tribal courts, I think. Yeah, this is, this is Bob, but I, I'd say I, you could do it theoretically, but I'm telling you, the, the, the federal courts have been so negative on the uh, assertion of jurisdiction over non-Indians on the reservation that I think it's a, it'd be a you know, brutally difficult case to establish tribal court jurisdiction. But another avenue, I mean, the, the EPA route, and then there's, you know, if there's state law grounds, you can always use state law uh, in, state in state procedures off the reservation. Uh, and then uh, it makes me think of the, uh, there's litigation out here in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, involving the uh, uh, the uh, assertion of uh, federal jurisdiction uh, over activities off of a reservation that harm treaty resources, and that's the uh, the culvert case involving uh, state actions that interfere with uh, uh, fish passage uh, under the the Stevens treaties that guarantee the right to fish at usual and the custom stations and the the federal, lower federal court said the state can't interfere off the reservation with that treaty right. Now that, and I would say the same theory could be used uh, if somebody is doing something off the reservation to interfere with a on-reservation, you know, water quality issue. But, I mean, it's a complicated and tough situation which would require years of, you know, uh, difficult and complicated uh, litigation if you can't negotiate something. Uh, up front. Yeah, I think you're right there, Robert, because the way the courts are now, they would question it, I think, big time. Okay, great. Um, thanks. The next question we have uh, is an audio question from uh, Brenda uh, Tamaras. Uh, Brenda, I have uh, unmuted your line, and uh, please ask your question. Um, okay, my my question goes back to the winner's doctrine in California because the state currently is taking the position that winners only applies to reservations created by removal of the lands from the public domain. Um, in California, as you may or may not know, we've got rancherias, reservations, lots of other um, types of Indian lands which weren't necessarily reserved from the public domain. Some of them were actually purchased from private individuals. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, the state's position regarding that. Well, this is Bob. Um, I mean, I think it's wrong uh, because, you know, Congress can create reserved water rights by withdrawing land from the public domain. Uh, or they can create reserved water rights just by setting land aside, by taking it in trust. Uh, and, you know, that when they take land in trust, uh, it's, uh, it could be construed, it's considered a use of the constitutional commerce power. Uh, and, you know, the, the solicitor or the Office of Legal Counsel and Justice Department in the uh, Reagan administration, or maybe it was the Bush administration, uh, agreed that that was a, a way to reserve water rights. It doesn't depend on uh, taking land out of the public domain. Uh, and so uh, I think you can do it either way. I mean, I've, I've had the same argument with state lawyers before, uh, and they are adamant that it has to be from the public domain, but I, I think that's wrong. 
Okay, great. I like that. This is Dwayne. I would just add in the non-federal uh, reserved water, or in the non-Indian reserved water right context, uh, in where where there are reserved rights for uh, land such as uh, national wildlife refuges, we have been successful in some instances arguing that there are federal reserved water rights for lands acquired uh, from public. Uh, from the public, uh, <clears throat> from private fee landowners, uh, then brought into the refuge system, uh, we have been successful in arguing that that those those lands uh, they have a pretty junior priority date, the date of acquisition or the date of the creation of the refuge, but they do have uh, an associated reserva implicit reservation of water. I couldn't guarantee that in every state, but it's it's somewhat analogous to the point you made and. I, I don't know if you, uh, you uh, the person asking the question, is familiar whether the Justice Department has been on point to uh, refute those claims yet in, in, in uh, California. I, I haven't seen it. Um, you know, very few tribes in California have any kind of quantification, really, with right. regard to water rights. So. Yeah, it's, it's easy where it's a different, sort of a different animal, different type of uh, uh, created uh, reservation for for uh, those kinds of arguments to to uh, arise they would uh, most likely I think be refuted in if it ultimately came to uh, an adjudication context at least yeah thank you very much Okay, hey, great. Thank you very much uh, for the question and answer. Is there uh, are there any any other uh, participants who have any questions at this time? Okay. Well, uh, it doesn't look uh, look doesn't look like anyone else has. Um, has any other questions right now? So um, at this point, I would just like to, uh, on behalf of uh, NCAI, um, the Tribal Water Work Group, uh, Native American Rights Fund, the Utten Center at the University of New Mexico, and Sandia National Labs, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Bob Anderson, Dwayne Meacham, Lois Trevino, and Scott Bulgren for, uh, for joining us on the call and for their expertise and insight on this, and uh, I would also like to uh, uh, send a special thank you to uh, Greg Howler at Ecosolv LLC for all of his work managing uh, the Tribal Water Work Group calls and helping to develop and organize this webinar. We couldn't have done it without him. Um, if you'd like uh, more information on the Tribal Water Working Group, you can contact uh, Greg Howler or myself. Both of our contact uh, information is on the final slide. Um, and thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we should be sending out a copy of the webinar slides to you shortly, and we have recorded this webinar for, um, for referring back to for your purposes, and we'll make that available online. Thank you all very much, and um, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>